I feel like I'm a little bit uh, ambitious, um, but you know, I'd love to be a nationwide certification. Um, I'd love to have partnerships with the existing disability advocacy groups covering all disabilities and chronic illnesses um, and be able to you know, really incentivize uh, business employees and owners to be educated. Welcome to King of the Big Deal podcast, hosted by Gretchen Kingma and Tiffany Dill, two Southern gals planted in the Midwest. We are a couple of occupational therapy entrepreneurs here to share our passion. From vacation homes to kitchen utensils, we talk all things universal design. And as universal design influencers, our goal is to create a more inclusive world together. We are kicking off our first season by connecting you with some awesome people here to help you ring in the holiday season with some universal design. Whether you're sipping on your favorite warm beverage or commuting to or from work, tune in and be sure to hit subscribe. We'd hate for you to miss out on the tips, trends, topics, and products that are leading the way within the universal design space. And we sound so good today because we are recording from this little box inside of Maryville's Design and Visual Art Studio. So we would like to give our local design school at Maryville University a shout out. Thank you for making our podcast extra awesome. Don't be fooled by how young this guy looks. Joe Jameson is wise beyond his years. This is evidenced by the amazing business in which he has founded. As a recent college graduate from the University of Virginia, Joe founded Visitable to solve a problem. Growing up, he witnessed his father call ahead to hotels, restaurants, and a myriad of other public places to ensure that he would be able to successfully navigate the scene as a wheelchair user. While it seems this would suffice in the realm of due diligence, Joe and his family experienced time and time again that that was simply not the case. Visitable exists to elevate the customer's experience when visiting public establishments within the community. I cannot wait for you to hear more from Joe and less from me, so let's dive in. Joe, thank you so much for being here on Universal Design King of a Big Deal podcast today. Our first question, which is the first question for everyone, tell us about yourself. Tell us about Visitable and how you got started and, and where you serve. Great. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, to provide you know, a little intro of myself. Um, I was a recent, I'm a recent graduate of the University of Virginia, graduated in May 2019, pursued the entrepreneurship minor while I was pursuing my bachelor's degree. And the capstone course for the class was uh, to create your own business. Um, the first thing they asked you to do was pick something you're passionate about. And my father has used a wheelchair my entire life. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, just because, you know, I grew up developing a passion for accessibility and really experiencing the different barriers and challenges that he did on a daily or uh, weekly basis. So I had to really hone in on two main problems that really I think I could make an impact in, was interested in making an impact in, and basically um, decided that, you know, there's this Americans with Disabilities Act that exists, right? Um, but that is the minimal compliance, um, and that's not to be confused with what is actually accessible for people with disabilities. And after I did a couple, you know, think a couple, uh, you know, hours of research, much, much more than that, but um, after doing some research, I found out that, you know, there are three shortcomings that I, around the ADA that I used to uh, illustrate this. One is the enforcement system being based mostly off complaints, which inevitably leads to a reactive and punitive approach to think about, consider, and improve accessibility. Um, then there's the verbiage in the ADA, which create loopholes or lacks of clarity. And of course, there are certain guidelines that aren't in the Americans with Disabilities Act, which are important to the disability community, such as how to treat people, verbiage to use, transparency about uh, how to navigate a space, um, and cer certain physical guidelines as well. Ultimately, it's hard to know how accessible a place is before you go. Um, so my father and I, we used to call ahead to you know, hotels and various other public uh, facilities and even going to my graduation from the University of Virginia. Um, and we you know, would ask how accessible it was and we'd be 
bounced around to three or four different people to get an answer. We'd uh, have to go deep into his disability and his conditions and his needs for each of those five people for mm. each location we went. Um, or we'd be told inaccurate information. We, they'd say, yes, it's completely wheelchair accessible, come on in. And then we'd be faced with a step or two and have to turn around and go to some, somewhere else or figure out a different path that wasn't very clear on the phone. So we found that this calling ahead process was you know, uncomfortable, tedious and uh, inaccurate or inefficient. And many I've talked to have echoed these experiences and feel the same way. Um, ultimately, you know, at least in our experience, um, and many others I've talked with, this has led to this barrier of uncertainty where people with disabilities are, you know, often going to the same places they already know that they have been to, that they know are accessible and welcoming already. Um, and even if you were to magically know if a place was accessible or not, um, there's no guarantee that a person with a disability will be treated the same as their non-disabled counterparts. And that's the second big problem I really wanted to focus on was the mistreatment of people with disabilities. I always give the example of uh, going to a restaurant with my father and having a host or hostess talk with me the whole time and not really acknowledge his presence. So clearly, as you can imagine, that would leave a bad taste in your mouth and you want to go want to go back. So just started Vistable to make an impact on, in these two problems. I really wanted to create a positive motivation and a proactive approach approach to consider, think about, and improve both physical accessibility, but also disability etiquette and how people with different abilities are treated. Um, so that is what Visible is. Our main tool of doing this is through our training certification process, uh, which includes a disability etiquette training. It includes uh, an, uh, an assessment on practical mobility access. It includes a secret shopper with a mobility challenge. It includes um, a report with feedback and suggestions. And it also includes a listing on our database of mobility information to help get rid of that barrier of uncertainty. And right now we are focused mainly on uh, mobility um, and all things mobility challenges, but hope to expand soon in the future. And, you know, we are mostly in, a, in a, uh, the greater Charlottesville, Central Virginia area, but hoping to um, expand very soon. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information, especially the ADA uh, minimum requirements and highlighting that because so many people do not know that um, those aren't often, they're often missed too because there's a lot of violations and a lot of errors from the um, ADA compliancy. Um, but you also highlighted another thing about employees not maybe understanding what ADA is when it comes to accessibility. So when you do call ahead, maybe those employees do not know much about the ADA as well. So thank you for highlighting that as well. Um, and I know like even after building, go through inspection, maybe the employees go in, they put things in the, um, the clearance and the turnaround clearance or they're obstructing the, um, the pathways and that sort of thing. So thank you so much for highlighting that again. Um, so our next question is basically a fun question. And um, since you and your father, you've shared the several experiences, the challenges that you guys have faced throughout your time um, in your local community and beyond. So with that being said, what are some of your favorite father and son memories um, or activities that you guys have done together that may have been more pleasant? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so I'll start off with that's almost two different questions I interpret it as. Yeah, it um, is. <laughs> uh, but the, but the, I'll, I'll start with the memories that, you know, are most pertinent to me. Um, one is that my father w worked at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I remember going to bring your son to work day and them having, um, you know, the got milk mustaches, posters and everything. I got like signatures from NFL players and like oh, was wow. able to, uh, get my own poster or picture with my dad where we had milk mustaches and we could try it for ourselves. Um, I remember, you know, going to DC with that and my dad taking me around in this car. And um, I also remember, you know, going on several vacations too. And um, that, that that's great. Like going on vacations. Like I remember Hawaii was a big one we went to, and we went to Northern California and toured some uh, wineries and stuff, but vacations are hard, honestly. Yeah. Um, when we go on vacations, they're, um, it starts at hotels and, uh, it's, uh, that's like, uh, and that's probably the most complicated part, honestly, uh, just being able to get the accessible room that you want, uh, and have all the accommodations that you need. Um, and then there's, 
you know, uh, some of the recreational activities uh, on vacation that, you know, aren't as accessible as you, you would hope. You don't want, you know, I don't want my dad sitting in a car like, in, you know, while my family and I are, are doing things, right? I want him to be involved. And I think that the future is promising with a bunch of adaptive sports and recreational therapeutic recreation programs and everything like that. Um, I wish that, you know, we had been in tune with some of those things when we went to Hawaii or, uh, you know, on some other recreational activities or even when I was in Boy Scouts, right? Like a lot of the campgrounds weren't accessible. Um, so yeah, those are some of my fond memories and some of the things that I wish had been greater memories as well, um, but weren't because of the due, due to the lack of access information and such. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I love that you shared, I wish that I could go to Hawaii. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, I read a statistic today that approximately $17 billion are spent in the travel industry by persons with disabilities every year. And so I am curious how many people to date, or not people, but how many businesses to date have uh, taken and received your visible certification? How, how, well, I won't, I won't hit you with two questions. Let's start with that one. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah, that's a great stat. I mean, I'm all about the uh, aggregate, like, you know, discretionary income and, and accessible travel spend. That's one I always keep in the back of my book. And I'm familiar with that one for sure. Um, so I recommend everyone keep that in the back of their minds as well. Um, but yeah, that's it. So technically we've worked with over 35 business locations, um, three governments and one university as of today. Um, so we are definitely uh, trucking along and recently, you know, expanded our, our reach to look at all public facing spaces, not just local businesses, but, you know, hopefully governments, public schools, and universities as well. Um, so that's that's the total number, I think, of, of everything we've worked with. Not everyone does the full certification at once. Sometimes it's about getting your foot in the door and showing them that you can provide value um, in hopes to do a cert uh, facility certification and then maybe you know trying the whole entire, all the facilities in the organization or training all the employees. Um, so it's really, it's, it's really a learning process, but um, that's everyone we've worked, worked with. I think it's super reputable that you were born out of a project in 2019. You launched your business in a pandemic and have that many businesses, municipalities, um, slash governments under your belt. So that's amazing. Keep going. That's Thanks. awesome. Speaking of keep going, what is your vision? What is your five-year vision for Visitable? Just out of curiosity. Great question. I, I feel like I'm a little bit... Uh ambitious. Um, but, you know, I'd love to be a nationwide certification. Um, I'd love to have partnerships with the existing disability advocacy groups covering all disabilities and chronic illnesses um, and be able to, you know, really incentivize uh, business employees and owners to be educated um, and in turn create, make it easier, make, you know, be, be able to show them the business case of being able to make improvements. And I think that's, you know, really what we're trying to do is raise awareness, training um, and knowledge so that, you know, businesses um, can feel comfortable making these changes and being aware of what changes to make. Um, and at the same time, we're hoping to employ a bunch of people uh, with varying abilities and be able to, um, you know, get them directly involved with advocating for disability inclusion in their own communities, too. I love that. Well, I am not a business school grad. Yet, I want to make sure that you are familiar with the acronym B-A-H-G, BAG. And as a young business owner, it is so important that you have BAGs. And that stands for Big Bleep Hairy Goals. <laughs> so if you don't have BAGs in your business, then you're, then you're not going anywhere. So I think that that big blank hairy goal is really, really awesome and reputable. And we can't wait to watch you grow. Uh, I want to know... With that goal of expansion, um, with expanding, we are here local to St. Louis. If someone wanted to learn more about your process or your expansion to the area, where could they go? What could they do? Right. Great question. So we are probably, you know, we're in the process of expanding to all abilities and thinking through our scalable process right now. I believe it probably takes um, about half a year minimum to make sure everything is in place for that to happen. But in the meantime, we have 
uh, ways to get involved through our forum, our social media, and also on our website, we have a get involved tab. Our website is www.visitable.org. That's like visitable.org. And um, there's a get involved tab where people can submit their um, interest in becoming a secret shopper. Um, and, and I think in the meantime, while we're building out these scalable processes, we're probably going to try some exp like experiments of doing this in other places. Um, and if people are really interested in the St. Louis area and they're filling out this form, um, that would be a perfect chance uh, for us to really, really uh, see how practical this is to scale it. And it's all about experimenting and and uh, making sure you can show proof of concept. So that's something we'd be definitely willing to do if we have the interest. Yeah, and tapping into those big resources. I know we have great advocate groups here in St. Louis that we could um, get connected with too. So thank Perfect. you for sharing that resource as well. So um, speaking of workplaces, and employees, how many, or what would you say is the percentage of workplaces or employees that are not aware of the accessibility needs? Right, I think that is a huge yeah. opportunity. Um, I'll phrase it that way. Um, yeah. I, I, I'd say maybe it's lucky if one or two have a relative or family member or friend that has a disability and they're thinking about it. Um, but for the most part, if you're talking about physical accessibility, I, I'd say that number is very low. Um, I think that, unfortunately, not a lot of people are exposed to people within the disability community, even though it, it makes up such a large portion of our population. And that's part of what our secret shopper hopes to, uh, you know, our secret shopper experience. That's hoping what it's, we're, we're trying to fix, right? We're trying to expose people um, and get them used to serving people with disabilities as our customers and visitors. Um, and to be able thinking about it through our training. So I would say that number is very low. I'd say it's probably less than 10% if I had to guess. Yeah. You have big hairy goals and diplomacy. You're going to go really far. Uh, I like how you framed that as far as uh, opportunity <laughs> because I would have some uh, less kind words. So <laughs> hats off to you. Um, next, and, uh, and our last question is with the holiday season in full swing, what is one thing that business owners can do to ensure that all customers experience that same joy that's in the air this time of year? Right. I was, I was, uh, I was getting this question quite a lot and I, th I think I do have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think it's honestly about making sure you keep a diverse crowd around you, giving you um, input and feedback. People of all abilities, all genders, like all nationalities, everything, right? Um, to make sure that you are being inclusive to everyone. Um, and I hope that's one thing: just making sure you have a diverse yeah. crowd around you, uh -huh. giving you feedback and input the, the whole the whole step of the way from start to finish of whatever you're doing. Yeah. And that's, I just mm -hmm. had a huge aha because we, we as entrepreneurs and business owners, we've all heard the quote that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's so true for businesses. If you want to be better, hang out with better people. Yeah. Uh, so that's such, yeah, that's a great, a great tip, a great piece of advice before we let you go, tell our listeners where they can find you self-promote, go crazy. Tell us where we can like, follow, hit the subscribe button, all the things. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, my Instagram is uh, visible certification. Um, and again, that's just visit able certification. That's our same thing with our uh, Facebook. Uh, and I believe as well as our LinkedIn, you can just look up visible on LinkedIn and then Twitter is visible underscore <laughs> um, because visible was taken. And our yep. website is www.visitable.org. Um, you can find our contact information on our website. We'd love to connect, talk ideas, network. Um, but yeah, looking forward to talking with more people. And thank you for this opportunity. Yes. Thank you for sharing us how universal design is really universal and going beyond ADA. So as our listeners may have noticed, we haven't really talked said universal design, but that's because that's, you know, integrated everywhere and it should be integrated um, seamlessly, to be honest. <laughs> right. Totally agree. I think it's about providing, you know, the user experience. Mm -hmm. um, I always, I always think of it that way when people are like, you know, talking about ADA compliance, I'm like, we're not an ADA compliance firm. We are a user experience firm for people with mobility challenges and physical spaces. 
yeah. at least at this moment and hopefully expanding from there. Yes. That's awesome. Well, have a happy awesome. holidays and we will talk to you soon. You Thank too. You. Have Bye. a great one. You too. And remember, if you don't take away anything from this podcast, be sure to go, go beyond, beyond ADA. ADA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. To learn more about what we do as outside of the box OTs, check out our entrepreneurial adventures. Gretchen at True Hold and Empowered Homes and Tiffany at Blue Day 2. Thanks again for listening, and we hope to have you with us for our next episode.